Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Mrs. Monica Gengos, First Lady of Republic of Namibia. Thank you. Please sit down. I was so happy when Uhuru did the protocol because I'm going to stand on the protocol established by him. Cheryl, if I looked confused when you were calling me this morning, it's because I'm not used to being called Your Excellency. So I continued walking, and then I realized she's talking to me. <laughs> so good morning, Cheryl. I'd like to congratulate USID and IREX for what they've managed to do with this um, Young Africa Leadership Program. It's absolutely essential. But if I'm insensitive to the title of a young African leader, please forgive me. At the age of 24, I sat on the board of one of the most powerful parastatals in the country. At the age of 27, I became the managing director of Stimulus and a shareholder um, of Stimulus, which has become the most uh, powerful private equity fund in the country. The reason I could do that is because Namibia, like many countries, has got a significant skill shortage. And what that means for many young Africans is that you're exposed to opportunities that in other countries you would probably not have given your age. So I'd like you to sometimes, and, 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 and the characterization of young can often lead to self-limiting beliefs. I'm a black female leader, I'm an African leader, I'm a young African leader. So these things sometimes, they, they create a mindset that if I don't get a certain position, maybe it's because I'm black, maybe it's because I'm female, maybe it's because I'm young. So I often reject these type of titles because having grown up as a black child, I suffered from what I call the triple jeopardy of being a black child. So when you're naughty at home, you get beaten at the scene of the crime. So if the scene of the crime is at a neighbor's house or a friend of your parents, they give you a beating. Then what they normally do is they send you home. And inev inevitably, you've got an aunt or an uncle or a grandmother at the home. She hears of your transgressions, she gives you another beating. The minute your mother or father walks into the room, your grandmother explains how you scandalize the family name, and lo and behold, the third beating of the day for the same crime. Now, these are things that we get used to. But one thing I'm not used to is the premium that we often live with for just being an African for just being a Namibian. There's an economic premium. The economic premium being there are matters, there are macroeconomic issues outside of your control that really make you poorer every single year because your currency usually depreciates against stronger currencies. So just by coming from the country that you come from, you become poorer because everything becomes expensive from an import perspective. So there's, an, there's a citizenship premium for what you do, and I feel it all the time in some of the companies that import products. And what we're seeing more and more is a sensitivity to price, but there's nothing we can do but to pass this price on to our consumers, because it's not cost that we control. But what are the consumers saying? Is that the economy cannot sustain these constant price increases, so you have this constant challenge. So that's from an economic perspective, but it also happens from a personal perspective. Because I've often read many stories of young African leaders, and I'm thinking this is actually relevant from a global perspective. But because the story is couched as an African story, it's as if we don't understand the lesson that it has for us. I, I, I hope I don't offend anybody by using Mandela as an example of this, because Mandela is this wonderful example of what you do to a former enemy. You forgive, you reconcile, you move on. And he became an icon for that. The world loved him. But when the very countries who tout his reputation as a reconciler, as a peacemaker, when they are faced with conflict, 
What do they do? Do they forgive? Do they reconcile? Or do they fight? So often we take people and we make them icons and we tell the African story, but we don't understand the global relevance of what they've done, nor do we apply it. The numerous books and speakers who focus on leadership, and there's some of these principles that are really, they're universal. But coming from the context many of us come from, and that's why I did a TEDx talk on what is called wounded leadership. You listen to stories like Uhuru's, at 17, you, bec you get tortured. There are people alive right now in leadership positions on this continent who have witnessed and have been the recipients of untold brutality, and they are leaders. Now, there's physical wounds, and I'm sure Uru has them, and we can see them normally, but there's also emotional wounds, and those you cannot see. And those are the things that end up destroying our countries. Those are the things that you cannot see in leaders that compromises the decisions that they make. Because often leaders are good at leading other people, but they're not so good leading themselves. If you look at the state of our homes, of our societies, and you look at the things we do and say when we are up on these podiums, there's a disconnect. There is a hypocrisy. And until we start talking about these softer issues, I don't think these leadership principles that we read in books are really useful because we're not applying them to ourselves. Wounded leadership is a topic all on its own. The topic of leadership in the 21st century is an entirely different topic as well. But I often see people talking about leadership in the 21st century without talking about people in the 21st century. Society has changed. I was recently called into what I can probably call a meeting by my children, four of them. Two are mine, the others I've raised. And these children had a list of grievances of all the things I do wrong. You don't listen, you don't consult, you just decide, and once you are right, you are right, and they had a list of grievances. And while I internalized some of their complaints and I could see the validity of what they were saying, I had to reject it and to tell them, you need to understand, in life, there is always somebody above you. There is always somebody prettier, thinner, richer, or more powerful than what you are. So it's not about me changing who I am as your mother, because actually you need me more than I need you. <laughs> but I'm not going to change to suit you. You need to figure out how you are going to adapt and make me behave in the way you want me to behave. And that is leadership, because often, Often, we are led and we are managed by our subordinates. I am led and managed by my subordinates all the time. I only realize it after the fact. And when it comes to society like my children, we've got a less hierarchical society today as it was 50 years ago. I never questioned my parents. My children questioned me every day. So I cannot assume that the challenges to my authority by my children will be, very, will be dissimilar to the challenges I face from people within organizations that I manage and lead. So often, you, you create a brand and leadership titles, but it's very important not to, not to let that define you, not to allow that to become who you are. It's nice being first lady. But it's a title, it's a temporary title. I gave a bit of a lecture to a young girl who told me, I want to be a first lady. <laughs> so I asked her, well, what happened in order for me to become first lady? You got married. I was like, why are you aspiring <laughs> to marry a president as opposed to aspiring to become a president? 
So often you need to deconstruct titles. And I much prefer my title as Managing Director of Stimulus or Chairman of eBank than a title of First Lady because you want to define what is your role? What is it that you do? What is your purpose? What, is it, what, what justifies and defends your existence? Being First Lady is temporary. Being a professional is actually permanent. Nobody can take that away from you. So you need to decide what is it about you that nobody can take away and not to rely on temporary issues like titles, like status, like positions. As a leader and as a lesson that I'd like to give to many of you is unfortunately you need to learn how to say no. People will take up all of the time you have to give. So often, I've, I've, I've become an expert in saying no. I've actually got templates, decline letters, no letters, whether it's to lunches, to dinners, to family events, to professional engagements. I've learned to say no. Because you end up doing more for others than what you have to do for yourself. It's not being selfish. You need to mentor. You need to give back. But you cannot do it to the detriment of what you're trying to achieve. Another lesson that I've learned and that I'd like to share with you is that now more than ever, we live in a society that it, it builds as efficiently as it breaks. I, I, I remember the story about two years ago, I think it was a South African born um, marketing executive who lived in America. And before she got on a flight to Cape Town, she tweeted something illogical about HIV and Africans. By the time she landed, she was fired. Now, I do believe it was a mistake, but we live in an unforgiving world, and a single mistake can define you. We live in a world with cell phones, with pictures, with cameras, sorry, with voice recorders. So everything you do, everything you say, can very easily become a matter of public record. Whether it's a conversation you have in the privacy of your home, where you share unflattering views of a different ethnicity, of an individual you don't like. Whatever you say, you must always assume, how would this look on the front page of the national newspaper? So you need to be more conscious now, in this era in which we live, than ever before. I had some exceptionally dodgy views when I was in university. And I'm so grateful there wasn't Facebook or Twitter <laughs> when I was in university, because I can guarantee you I would have tweeted those views. And I can guarantee you, you would have gone to unearth those tweets and say, wow, this is what the first lady of Namibia said. So, and I see a lot of young people doing that. And I wonder, when you tweet, is it consistent with where you want to be in 10 years time? Is it going to work for or against you in 10 years time? The things you put on Facebook, the things you put on social media, the things you tell your friends. Is it things that can be used against you? So you need to be strategic. You need to be, thank you, you need to be strategic about where you want to go in life and you have to do everything else. I got a government funded loan in, to finance my education. <clears throat> I made a decision, I'm going to pay it back, and I was the laughing stock of all my peers. None of them had any intention, have never paid the loans that they got to finance the education. But I knew I was going to become successful when I left university. And I knew if I don't pay my fees, I will be the one the media will one day castigate. So you need to have a very clear direction in your mind. And you need to, 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 to behave consistently with what you want to achieve. So we've talked about digital footprint. I'm not reading a speech. I find it very difficult. While we're talking about digital footprint and being careful of what you leave out there, you must also be careful of leaving nothing. <laughs> it's true. Often we try and Google you. And if I find nothing on the internet about you, 
I will wonder what has this person been doing? Not even an opinion piece on a topic. What have you been doing? You've never been covered by the media. You've never put anything on Facebook. You've never be, put anything on Twitter. This counts against you. So even if it means writing unsolicited letters to random newspapers hoping they get published, you need to be on Google. If I Google you right now, what am I going to find? It better not be nothing. <laughs> then I want to talk about the schizophrenic relationship almost that most of us have as leaders. Because when I stand here and I speak to you, I stand here dressed in a certain way and I can speak to you in a certain way. I can operate in a relatively sophisticated environment. But as an African, I also need to learn how to operate in an unsophisticated environment. I need to be able to talk in a community setup, in a rural setup, in a way that I'm understood by those I'm speaking to. I need to dress differently, I need to act differently. When I'm around my father, I act differently. And I don't want to use the example, but I'm quite happy calling Cheryl by her first name. Let me try do that in a rural area to a friend of my mother, and I will meet a very painful end. <laughs> but I've got no qualms, because I do understand I operate in two different worlds. And we need to embrace that. I don't think we should ever be ashamed of where we come from and how we operate where we come from. But we also need to know how to operate in a different environment, in a way that you continue to be relevant. So be schizophrenic. Have two personalities, because there are two worlds that we are all living in. We often make personal sacrifices to be where we are. I've got a suspicion that this program probably has more female leaders than male. Our country has a, a gender-based violence problem, passion killings, assaults, all kinds of abuse. And I think it's typical from a country that's experienced as much pain as some of our countries have experienced. But I think there's something else happening there. I think there's a, there's a power play and a power shift happening in our societies that is manifesting itself in violence against women because the roles are changing and often people assert themselves through violence with uh, its poor communities who aren't heard and who riot and strike in a violent manner or it's a husband who beats his wife because she doesn't behave because she doesn't know who the head of the household is so many of us have paid a, pers a, a personal sacrifice in order to be where we are. And maybe we were too young to understand these challenges, but often these relationships that crumble. They are children who don't get the attention they should get. They are family members who don't get access. They are friends who you don't see. There is a personal sacrifice to be made. I think this illusion of balance is just that. It's an illusion. I think sometimes I'm a wonderful mother and at other times I'm a wonderful businesswoman. But I'm never wonderful at both of those tasks at the same time. <laughs> then I want to talk about the relationship between money and power. It's, they're very uncomfortable bedfellows because the one normally seeks the other. What is the point of having a lot of money if you have no power? So very quickly, rich people start trying to translate that wealth into power. They start cozying up to politicians, they start trying to be politicians. And the opposite is also true. What is the point of having all this power and you're poor? So politicians start trying to monetize their power into wealth. And that is where corruption starts. So the relationship between money and power really is one that, if not managed well, destroys countries. And it's, it's a difficult relationship because the one inevitably leads to the other. And how do you manage that? We, we face that challenge now. I think as First Lady, the question I always get asked is, 
How are you going to make sure that your business interests don't conflict with your existing role? What my husband and I have decided is we're going to do declarations. It's not required of me, it's not required of him, but we will declare all of our assets. And in that way, people can know what you own, where it is. I don't want to hide through proxies. And they can see where the wealth that you have has been created and not have to suspect you each time you buy expensive things that you stole it from the people. So declaration of assets, transparency. <laughs> and communication are key issues in leadership. It's a double-edged sword. I don't necessarily want everybody to know what I own and how much it's worth, but I guess there's a bigger price um, to leadership at times. But it also comes down to a personal discomfort. Many of you are doing wonderful things for your countries. Many of you are highly qualified, highly experienced, and I'm sure many of you have wonderful footprints, digital footprints in your media. You get covered, but you haven't monetized that brand. So you've got this wonderful profile, but you're not making money from it. And that shouldn't be your focus either. <laughs> There's one putting up his hand. And at times, you do what you love, and you become wealthy from it. But then there are days where it makes a hypocrite out of you. I remember one day I had wanted to go into a township. And without realizing it, I changed cars. I took my son's car. And I got in the car and I realized, you know, it's a bit stupid. Look at this handbag. And you're going to a poor community. So I changed handbags. And then I thought about it as I was trying. Why am I trying to hide what I have? So there is a constant discomfort when you see at how the opportunities you have relative to how other people live. And if you look at it from a global perspective, inequality is global. Actually, it's biblical according to Uhuru. <laughs> but it's, 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 it's a problem where the resources are sufficient. It's the way we distribute it that isn't. So we need to find a better way to distribute resources. We need to find a better way to include everybody in the community because you need to look at a society, a, a country, citizens, as a group. A group is supposed to protect, people protect the group. You act in a protective way to allow the group to survive. Now if there are people in that group who don't benefit from it, who are not protected by it, they actually benefit from chaos. That is exactly what they'll do. And then this trend where if people act in an inhumane way, we want to call them savages, but we allow them to live in inhumane conditions. But when they react in inhumane ways, we judge them for that. It's as much... So that is as much our responsibility as it is theirs. If I have no interest in that group, I don't care for its peace and stability because that peace and stability doesn't translate into a better life for me. So we must be more inclusive. The word tribalism I don't like for a very petty reason. The petty reason being I never hear, you know, you find conflict in Eastern Europe, which is actually tribalistic, but it's characterized as religious conflict. Tribalism is a word only used for African conflict. So I don't like the word. So let's, what, what other word can we use? Ethnicism or whatever. Sorry? Discrimination is so wide. So, so to me, I'm talking about you don't speak the same language as I do, although we share a common culture. Now, that is something that is destroying Africans. Because often our conflict had ethnic, ethnic lines. Colonialism only added to it, but those ethnic lines, those fault lines, was there before. And often what happens, because you were in the trenches with somebody, those are the people you trust. So when you come into government, those are the people you appoint. 
So we must stop only trusting the people who speak the same language as we do, who look the way we do, who believe the things we believe. And understand is we must include a wider group of people. I made the mistake of putting gum in my mouth and I'm owning up to it because it's bothering me. <laughs> so be at peace with what your role is, whether you manage to monetize it or not. I am actually inspired by people who are happy with what they do. I'm inspired by teachers because I could never be a teacher. I could never be a nurse. I could never be happy with not, I had to be where I am now because that's the only thing that would make me happy. So I'm inspired by others who are comfortable with the roles that they play. All of you, none of you look very young to me actually. So, I'm going to not call you young African leaders. I'm just going to call you leaders, if you don't mind. Yeah. And I'm going to say to you is the inequality is, is there's a financial element to it, but there's also inequality in opportunity, which is probably the worst, where you and I can have exactly the same skill but I have access to opportunities that you don't have. So we need to provide more people with access to opportunities. And then we make our, our countries and our continent move forward. I think we're all tired of the typical embarrassing stories about Africa. And I'm sure you do it. It's like about my family. I've got a few relatives really who are, you can't defend their actions. And we've got family groups and we castigate them and we, we admit and we, 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 we're not in denial about their shortcomings. But outside the family, you never criticize a family member. As a matter of fact, you pretend you don't even know the things they do. And as Africans, we, our continent has forced us to do that. So often when you see African leaders pretend they don't know what's happening, they know. They just don't want to say it in your presence. So believe us, we do talk about these things to one another. We just don't want to hear it from others. But it is time that we start having honest conversations about the status of our continent, of our countries, and all the things that we do that we know we shouldn't be doing. Thank you.